So the, the role of the nervous system in the hematopoietic microenvironment, how did it come about? Um, that's, a, that's a question. So that's a, that's a long time ago. You know, it's, it started, um, actually we, we uh, it, was a, it was at the time a crazy idea. We started with this, um, slowly, we were interested in stem cell mobilization. We had found that glycans, sulfated glycans were playing a role in mobilization and we we're trying to figure out how these glycans were working. And we got some mice that were uh, deficient in the ability of making uh, sulfated glycans and found that the uh, mobilization of stem cells was dramatically impaired in these, in these animals. So, um, so we tried to figure why that was. It turns out that these mice had an obvious neurological phenotype. And I tried to convince a student to work on this, but you know, he wouldn't work on this because it was, you know, he felt it's too crazy of an idea. Nobody wanted to work on this. To see, to ask, you know, maybe the nervous system is explaining, the defect of the nervous system is explaining the phenotype. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, looking at classical uh, molecules that may be abnormal. And then uh, we had to, we had to at some point, we ruled out everything else. So then, then we said we may, we should look at the nervous system seriously. So it took us, you know, it took us two years probably to before the, between the time we could have done it to the time we actually did it. And and when we did it, um, you know, the first experiment we did was disrupting sympathetic nerves, and we found that there were defects. So, so that explained you know, a lot of the phenotype. So that was. Yeah, that was probably the first the first uh, time, and the the you know when you do one thing, we never you never sh sh sure at the beginning how you know if it will stand and what's going on and whether how robust it is, and so we tried to do as much as we could with the with the uh, reagents we had at the time. But I think when we made the observation that circadian oscillations of stem cells was dependent on neural signals, that's where also we, you know, very, we're very confident that this uh, phenomenon is probably important, uh, not only for, for GCSF-induced mobilization, but if it's, it's important in normal physiology, so that's probably an important phenomenon. So that was you know, a couple of years later, yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of this happened by accident. In science, a lot of it happened by accident. So I ended up working on cell adhesion, uh, not because I was particularly attracted to this. I just happened, I liked the, uh, the, uh, my future mentors, I liked their, the way they were doing science, but I didn't like the topic very much. And, but I, I've become to like the topic after I started, I, I worked on this. Um, and so I spent a lot of time working on cell adhesion now. And, but initially that was not, you know, it's not the topic that really attracted me. I actually was interested in in cancer, um, that's what I would have liked to work on, but I never found an opportunity to work on cancer. And so I, and whenever I was trying some experiments in cancer, it didn't work. So when I was working in other fields, it was working much better. So I just decided to give up what I wanted, but followed the science. <laughs> I just, <laughs> and that's what I've done ever since. I follow the science, I don't really decide what I'm going to work on. The only, um, you know, the only uh, caveat to this or uh, um, uh, the moderation, I would say, to, to this statement is, is that I, I, I'm a hematologist, so I work in blood, so I work in, in a lot of things in science, but I try to restrict our, what, what we do in, in, in blood. Um, although we do work on prostate, uh, but that's uh, as far as I'm going to go. So we try to stay in the blood as much as possible. Okay. 
one of the major limit is obviously the samples. I mean, it's to get uh, access to to tissue. That's that's certainly a big uh, limit. Uh, the other limits are limits that you have with any human tissue, which is that you cannot, you know, make a transgenic human or have a, a GFP labeled. Uh, uh, cells in vivo and, and these kinds of limits. But uh, nowadays with uh, the ability to, uh, to edit uh, the genes, you know, all the gene editing technique and gene modification techniques, I think it's changing things a little bit um, more certainly for, for hematopoietic stem cell or cells that you can isolate and at least transiently culture. The microenvironment is always difficult because you cannot recreate the microenvironment in the dish very easily. So that's always a problem. It's a, it's a problem for mouse, it's a problem for human. Um, so that's why we rely so much on in vivo information. And, and for obviously the human, it's more difficult to do these studies in vivo. So that that's, remains a, a big a challenge. Um, so there are multiple limits. I think a tissue, uh, a lot of um, um, technique and uh, limitations, um, but there's some improvement with the technology that, that will allow us to get more, more insight. Um, but we haven't scratched the surface, so there's, there's certainly, there are studies to be done right now with even with these limitations i think we can do more in humans i was interested in medicine i was interested in research i knew that mds could do research and to me it was also i didn't know research whether i would be successful, survive, or how I would do. Um, so, and I like medicine, so I thought that maybe if I do medicine, I'll have the option. And so I'll do medicine, I'll try to do research. If it works, I'll do research. If it doesn't work, at least I have a job. <laughs> I can fall back and do medicine. That was that was the reason I I did MD. That in the end, that was actually the reason. But I always wanted to do research. Uh, I always I, that's what I was passionate about, and and um, that's what I'm I'm doing now. Or I'm fortunate to do now. Well, you know, there's, there could be a long list of advice. I, I think, um, I think it's the best advice I can have is to follow your passion. I think, uh, I think this is, uh, um, yeah, I think this is uh, this is very important. And you know, in science, it's always uh, it's there are up and down moments. You know, there are great uh, moments, but they're also moments that are always more difficult either because you know technically you know there are projects that are not going as well as the as they should or as they could or it's because you're dealing with uh, papers that are rejected grants that are rejected and and all that stuff so there are a lot of so there's some difficulty but if you persist i think if you keep keep at it and follow the, the passion that you have, eventually most of these things can be, it can be overcome. I think for young scientists it's something to be, to keep in mind and not to be discouraged by the first rejection um, that they get uh, because um, there are gonna be many more rejections. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so they have to get, you know, you have to, get used to it and, and uh, you know, and, and, and continue on. Uh, there'll be, after these rejections, there'll be, uh, there'll be successes that will come.